On the show today, our guests will be making a case for the future of the Commonwealth. As always, you can join the conversation with the hashtag Beyond Markets. You can follow my Twitter handle too, at Esther Obudaga. Now, this year's theme for the Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting is Towards a Common Future. And the 53 Nation Member Club is home to about 2.4 billion people spread over six continents and it's a post-colonial conference of countries mostly united by a common past, that is, the British Empire. So what is the Commonwealth advantage in this present day? Paul Arkwright, the British High Commissioner to Nigeria, joins me to discuss this and more. Paul, it's a pleasure to have you Thanks on the show today. Great so to be here. Let's start, before you answer that question, let's start with the theme for this year's uh, meeting, Towards a Common Future. Speak to the significance of this theme. You, you touched on it already, um, the number of people in the Commonwealth. What you, the figure that you missed there was that 60% of that 2 billion people, 60% are under the age of 30. Hmm. So the question is, what can we do to make the Commonwealth a fit organisation for the future, for the young people of today? How can we help uh, through jobs, through uh, employment, through uh, sustainability, climate change, etc.? How do we tackle some of the big issues around security to make the future of the Commonwealth and therefore the globe a safer, a better, more prosperous space for, for uh, young people of today. And the Commonwealth Summit, which is going on this week, um, is looking at some of those big global issues to see what we can do to improve things for, uh, for our young. Let's take a step back, back to that question also. For those who, who are not part of the Commonwealth and who ask that question, how, why, is, why is it relevant and what has been done uh, in the last couple of decades that you point to and say this is what we've achieved and this is what we're going to pass on down to the youth, the next generation mm -hmm. of Commonwealth? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think the Commonwealth is a, is a family of countries, if you like. They're, they're united by a common past. They're you united use the by... word family in that club. I think so. Okay. I mean, it is, it's, it's, it's more of, why not? It's a family. There's a kind of family, I, I was in London earlier this week, there is a family atmosphere. You know, people are very... Um, easy with each other, you know. It's uh, there's a, there's a, it's 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 easy to communicate within the within the Commonwealth, and that's for lots of good reasons. Uh, so yes, it does work um, from that kind of people to people side of things. Uh, what has it done in the last two decades? Well, the Commonwealth played a very important role in apartheid, in the ending of apartheid. Nigeria, of course, was at the forefront of that within the Commonwealth uh, of tackling that um, on trade. It's been proven that trade is 20% cheaper. Uh, when done between uh, two Commonwealth countries than between a Commonwealth country and a non-Commonwealth country. So there's already that Commonwealth factor, the value added in there. On democracy, uh, the Commonwealth has played a very important role in things like election uh, observing, uh, in keeping people on track, uh, the big questions around uh, democracy in Africa and elsewhere where the Commonwealth has been involved through the offices of the Secretary General of the Commonwealth. Um, and in security, again, political mediation, the Commonwealth has played a really important role uh, in all of that. All of those are relevant, but what the Commonwealth uh, Summit is doing in addition to that is looking at things like malaria, a commitment made by the 53 heads of state and government there to halve malaria by 2023. Nigeria suffers from malaria, as we know, sadly, there are millions of people who, who die of malaria in Nigeria every year. A commitment to education, 12 years of quality education for girls and boys. That's something which is very specific, something which is incredibly important, again, to, to young people. I, I always say when I'm here, education is, is absolutely critical. And there's not enough investment in education uh, in Nigeria. Why is it? I mean, we benefit, the UK benefits, obviously, from uh, people going overseas, mm -hmm. going to, to the UK to study. Yeah. But, uh, you know, I would prefer in many ways that people felt that they didn't have to do that, that there was uh, an investment in education in Nigeria, which would mean that people stay here, are happy to send their children to school here and to university here, and then build up that, uh, that uh, expertise, the skills, the literacy, et cetera, of, of young people. And again, the Commonwealth has a, has a role to play in that. So a number of very specific commitments, which the heads of state and government at their meeting today are going to sign up to, including uh, President Buhari. Uh, and then, of course, it's up to the people of the okay. Commonwealth to hold them to account. Now, if you look across the member nations, especially in, uh, I mean, in Africa, and you look at the human indicators, hu the indices, economic indicators, human capital development, across health, education, I mean, 
I, I hear what you say with you know the achievements that have been made. But if you look at the numbers, they're actually quite bleak from health, especially between health, education, and employment. Mm. The very, I mean, many of them are abysmal. I mean, Nigeria, we're still dealing with high mortality rates. I mean, one in five children die before they're five. And you ask yourself, why is it that we're still dealing with growth that's still not inclusive? And I know that's, one of, that's going to be on the agenda. Also, President Buhari yeah. spoke at, a for, uh, at uh, I think, one of the business. Yes, he did. Uh, and yeah. he talked about the fact that growth is still not inclusive. So is that a big concern for the Commonwealth? I mean, we've come so far, but mm -hmm. when one looks at the statistics year in, year out, mm -hmm. It doesn't look like there's much progress. The numbers, are, some of them mm. are quite frightening, mm. actually. Mm. Well, you're right. There are problems here. Actually, it was Bill Gates, wasn't it, a few mm. weeks ago when he was here. He was talking about human capital. Uh, and one of the huge benefits that Nigeria has is the, in fact, I would say that the best thing that Nigeria has is the people of Nigeria, their entrepreneurial spirit, the way that they go and uh, go out there and get things done is, is, is amazing. So that human capital is, is extraordinary. But if it's not matched with education, if it's not matched with health standards, if it's not matched with jobs and employment opportunities, then there is a risk in the large numbers of Nigerians who we expect to be born in the next 20, 30 years. The Commonwealth and at the summit are looking at setting standards, at uh, setting targets which every country uh, will be required to meet. There will be uh, a monitoring and evaluation mechanism. There will be peer pressure. I think mm. you know it's really important. You know if. Uh, if a, if a president stands up in front of, you know, an, a, an audience know, uh, or in a TV studio and, and says, well, I commit to X, Y and Z, that's important. But if he does it in front of 50 other presidents and prime ministers and makes a personal commitment to, to uh, changing things, then that's also really important. Uh, and the Commonwealth has that sort of binding, has that um, uh, ability to ensure that people um, really do meet those commitments. So we'll, we'll continue to push on that, you know, but the UK is not perfect I know, either. I, I, know. So I was just going to make all this point also that uh, at, the heart of, at the heart of this, because political analysts keep telling us that at the heart of many of the issues is the quality of leadership. And so is it now fair to say that, I mean, there's only so much that the Commonwealth, you know, that the UK can do? If, you know, in most instances, mm. you prescribe a certain, uh, you put us certain recommendations in mm. terms of how uh, a country can progress along economic and human, you know, indicator lines. But you know, leadership doesn't come through. There's no political will, and I mean, there's only so much, like I said, that you can do. Do you find yourself in that situation a lot of times? Well, personally, um, the UK. Uh, the UK. Yeah. I, I, one thing I just want to pick you up on, actually, you said the UK and the Commonwealth. So the UK is not the Commonwealth. Well, I okay. Know. And, 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 but it's, it's, it's true, that's what a lot of people in Nigeria think. When they think Commonwealth, they think the UK, okay. they think London, they think the Queen, they think, you know, whatever. Uh, the UK is, is 53 countries who should be um, working together and not through, sorry, the Commonwealth, 53, not just working through the UK. Um, that said, what, what, what you said about leadership is, is very important. I think uh, when uh, leaders stand up and make commitments, um, they should be held to account, and that's, that's, that's in the UK as much as in Nigeria or in Ghana or okay. in Kenya or any other Commonwealth country in Africa. Um, and I think part of the purpose of these meetings is to demonstrate that public commitment and then for the people to, to okay. hold them to it. Now, for this year's meeting, there are four main goals that will be focused on. Uh, talks are going to be focused around these four main goals. First is prosperity, uh, boosting inter-Commonwealth trade and investment. Uh, how would you describe that as it stands right now? President Buhari also talked about the fact that uh, he feels that there should be more deeper uh, inter-Commonwealth trade, uh, that he feels that that will also help create those jobs for the unemployed mm -hmm. youth and, of course, boost uh, the individual co uh, economies of the, of the members. Yeah. It's, it's, it's crucial. I go back to jobs and, and youth employment and, and, and the importance of uh, dealing with the future. Um, uh, Intra-Commonwealth trade um, is, uh, is not as good as it should be. So one of the purposes of the Commonwealth Summit this, this week is to provide facilitation to enable uh, to have certain agreements which are not free trade agreements between the Commonwealth, we're not going that far, but nevertheless certain practical steps which would make it easier, which would cut red tape, which would help to lower tariff barriers in some areas. So some of those um, very practical steps which can improve uh, Commonwealth trade. And actually, you know, I was at the business forum uh, there. One of the purposes of that kind of thing, uh, and the, the president, as you say, President Bihari was there, is for people to match up, for people to reach out across to other members of the Commonwealth, mm -hmm. other businesses, business to business links, when you've got those links, people can see the possibility. They can see the, 
the real value of the Commonwealth in trade. So that is um, important and it's, it's a marketplace, if you like. The business forum there was, was all sorts of, there was a real buzz, it was really positive. But it was about businesses talking to business, facilitated by government, but driven by the private sector, um, so that that trade thing can pick up. And then just one more point on trade. It is, it is a proven fact, the economists will tell you, that no developing country or underdeveloped country um, can actually reach uh, a developed status without competitive exports. You cannot survive on an internal market. You have to export. That's why uh, protectionism is dangerous. Protectionism around the world is dangerous. It's why you've got to remove barriers, reduce barriers, so that trade can flow freely between countries. Um, and that's how Nigeria will thrive. Nigeria will thrive, um, of course, by providing food for its own people. But ultimately, you know, why aren't Nigerian avocados on the shelves of Sainsbury's in, in, in London? You know, why aren't the excellent mangoes that are produced here uh, so for sale? Value, value uh, added export, uh, apart from ex value added export. Exactly. Uh, so exactly. Because, uh, we also hear the intra, I mean, I, I call this off, uh, intra Commonwealth trade to increase by 17% to $700 million by 20, by the year 2020. I'm thinking, 700 billion, I think. Uh, 700, 700 billion. I'm thinking, is, is that a good number? It's, it's a I good mean, number. And it's I mean, significant, it's, it's, I'm thinking, it's but increase. is it one that, uh, can we achieve that by 2020? If we look at, I mean, if, taking yeah. into consideration some of the barriers that, you know, that continue to exist. Yeah, so it, it, it's fine to have a target, but you've yeah. got to do something about getting to that target. Okay, so that's what the Commonwealth um, uh, Trade Facilitation Agreement is about. It's about how do we reduce those barriers to help improve the uh, intra-Commonwealth trade and, and get it up to those levels by 2020. You, know, also, you have to also, be ambitious. Uh, absolutely. Be I, was, ambitious. I was going to mention also the, the uh, new the continental, the African Continental <coughs> Free Trade Agreement. That's yeah. also in the works and that is going mm -hmm. to, you know, we're expecting that to really, really boost intra-African trade, yeah. both between Commonwealth and non-Commonwealth members. So I'm thinking yeah. if that, that could, it, could in itself be a game, a big game changer, and I suppose boost, you know, like sort of complement what is being done with uh, Commonwealth. Uh, absolutely. So uh, the, 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 this is complementary. This yeah. is not in competition. So you have the Africa Free Trade Agreement, which I hope Nigeria will sign uh, very Hopefully. soon. Fingers crossed. Uh, <laughs> We have the uh, ECOWAS, of course, which in itself is a, is a free trade area and the barriers, mm -hmm. uh, tariff barriers are down on that. Um, you have African Union and, and, and other uh, organisations. The Commonwealth is not trying to replace any of that. The Commonwealth is complementary to that. And if um, uh, trade can increase between African countries as a whole, then naturally trade will increase um, between African Commonwealth countries. Um, and I would say, I would argue that those links, which are strong already, should be strengthened and that we should see even more trade between Nigeria and Kenya or Nigeria and Rwanda or Nigeria and Ghana the blocks, and South East, Africa. West, uh, um, uh, because the Commonwealth is represented across the whole of the continent. Um, and that gives a, a, a huge added value to Nigeria, a benefit to Nigeria, which I hope they can seize in the, in the years to come. Paul, we'll take a short break. Sure. Thank you for your time so far. We'll come back and pick up from where we left off. I've been speaking to Paul Arkwright, British High Commissioner to Nigeria. If you're just joining us, we've been speaking on the future of the Commonwealth. And my guest is Paul Arkwright, the British High Commissioner to Nigeria. Paul, thank you for your time so thank far. You. Let's pick up from where we left off. We'll talk, we're talking about the Continental Free Trade Agreement. Let's talk about the uh, economic uh, partnership agreement. Nigeria still has declined to sign and says that it's not mutually beneficial mm. and wants to see some line items change first. And I'm thinking uh, it would be a good idea if Nigeria could sign on, if Nigeria could agree to the terms or, I don't know, but it would be good for us to sign. But what are your thoughts on it? The fact that it's dragged in for this long. I think it's a shame that it's dragged on uh, so long. Um, it took 10 years to negotiate it. Obviously, Nigeria was very much uh, a part of that negotiation team through ECOWAS. Uh, obviously, as a member, uh, still a member of the European Union, uh, the UK supports uh, an EPA in West Africa. We do think it will be uh, very important. I think there's been some uh, misperceptions, should we say, about what the EPA is all about. I mean, it is, uh, I think, carefully calibrated. I don't think it's going to open up uh, uh, African markets to cheap uh, European exports. There are some protections in there. There are some um, key tariffs which will come down, which will absolutely benefit Nigeria. Um, and I think once you look at the detail, and um, people who do actually study it should know that this is something which I strongly believe should be of benefit to Nigeria. So 
I do hope Nigeria will sign up. Uh, I hope that they'll do so soon. Um, the signs are not particularly positive, I, I have to admit. Um, but uh, along with my colleagues from the European Union uh, here in Nigeria, we are strongly supporting uh, an EPA, which we think is a win-win. It's not just a, a win for, for Europe. I think yeah. it's a win for Africa, it's a win for West Africa, and, and in particular, it's, it's a win for Nigeria. As we were discussing earlier, Nigeria needs those markets. They may feel that they're not ready yet to export. I, I think that's, I think that's the, the, the crux of the matter, the fact that uh, we look at our industrial base, yes, because some uh, analysts argue that these, some of these agreements just focus on reducing tariffs, like even this, the CFTA itself, just yeah. reducing tariffs, and not looking at the individual industrial capacity of each country. Right. Some countries have access, or some manufacturers outside of Nigeria have access to cheaper lines of credit and they produce those goods at you know, quite cost-effective prices. And, and so the manufacturers here are saying, how are we going to become competitive when we leave? We're operating in a high interest rate environment mm -hmm. where we get loans for 20, between 20 and 20, 30 percent. How are we going to compete with a guy who gets it for 0.25 mm -hmm. percent? So I'm thinking those are well, legitimate think, concerns. The, the, and they're, the, not, yeah. they're not issues that can be solved in weeks or even months. So. No, um, but I don't, and I don't think it's one single thing that is going to make all the difference. I think uh, interest rate need, rates need to come down for um, especially MSMEs who, are, who, who need to borrow to, to prosper, to, to grow, to create more jobs. Uh, that's a part of it, and I know the government is, is working on that. Um, but what I would say is that as tariffs come down uh, and as uh, the world becomes more competitive, Nigeria has to be part of that. So if you're, if you're volunteer, voluntarily withdrawing from something like that, if you're falling back on excuses, well, we're not at the same right. stage of um, development as other countries, then when will you get to that stage of okay, development so where you are, where you're going to become it competitive? Now and look, you know, longer term, because I'm thinking that's well, that, it, it, it would appear it, that that's what it looks like. I, I genuinely think yeah. there's a risk of Nigeria losing out. You know, in to the say run. to say we're not competitive now, so we should we sh we can't mm -hmm. sign anything. You know, competition uh, breeds innovation. Without innovation, Nigerian companies are not going to be able to compete in the world market. And you may think that with 420, 450 million Nigerians by 2050, that internal market will be sufficient. Well, I would challenge that. I don't think it will be sufficient. I think if Nigeria is to thrive, it needs to export and it needs to export competitively. So, yes, you don't want to be flooded by cheap imports. I absolutely understand that. But also, people need to rise to the challenge. Manufacturers need to rise to the challenge. Uh, of becoming more competitive, of seeing where they can uh, save costs, become more efficient, um, all of that. And, it, and it's a driver. You know, the EPA would be a driver, I think, for uh, Nigeria, not just for the manufacturing base, but for agriculture, for other mm -hmm. sectors as well. Okay, let's, let's move on to security. That's one of the topics, the issues that will be discussed this year. We've seen that rise in uh, terrorism, not just, you know, here in Africa, global terrorism, but Africa has its own uh, share of the of the issue as it were, the West African region, particularly Nigeria, we have got Boko Haram now, we're dealing with a herdsman, killer herdsman crisis, and it would appear that right now Nigeria really can get all the help and support you know, that it can get. And I know that the UK, the likes of the UK, France, and the US have been providing support. Mm -hmm. So in what way will this be discussed at this year's meeting, and are there recommendations, or is there a certain approach that will be taken? Well, first of all, um, just to, to touch on what the UK is already doing in terms of our sort of bilateral support for Nigeria, we've already trained over 28,000 Nigerian uh, infantry uh, going up to fight Boko Haram in the northeast. We're providing uh, intelligence. We're working very closely, as you say, with the uh, US and France. Um, we're looking, we have supplied some defence equipment. We're looking at what more we can do. Um, we are very heavily engaged and invested in supporting the Nigerian military in the fight against Boko Haram. In terms of the, what the Commonwealth can do, it's less of a peacekeeping organisation, which is perhaps more for the UN, or indeed the African Union, which as you know has its own peacekeeping operations, um, and more of a political forum, uh, which can help, possibly help with political mediation, with um, good offices of the Secretary General, with the peer pressure from other uh, uh, Commonwealth governments uh, to actually make sure this happens. The other area which we're looking at in this particular summit is uh, what we call combating violent extremism. Um, and that is really about how do you tackle some of the ideologies which are behind uh, extremist movements, especially uh, extremist jihadist uh, movements. How can we cooperate on that? And on uh, the wider question of cyber security, which is a big issue which 
um, uh, we've, we've read all about the threats from various, uh, from various places. Cyber security, you know, if you're not secure from cyber attack, uh, then all sorts of things can go horribly wrong. And, uh, you know, we're discovering that in the UK, uh, just as, uh, as many people are. So that's another area where the Commonwealth can work together, share best practice, understand each other and, 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 and help each other through cooperation. Well, with that being said, uh, are you, how concerned, I mean, is the entire group with how it's progressed, the issue of terrorism has progressed, and what are your thoughts on how Nigeria has dealt with the issue in the first place? Well, I think Nigeria has dealt with, this government has dealt with the Boko Haram threat uh, successfully. I don't think the Boko Haram threat is over. Uh, we've seen that. We've seen the uh, the terrible abduction of the Dapchi girls. We know that uh, over 100 of the Chibok girls are still uh, uh, in, uh, in the hands of Boko Haram. Um, we've seen some attacks, in particular the uh, vile attacks using children, uh, uh, suicide bomb attacks in the northeast in particular. Um, so there's, there's still some way to go uh, on that. But I do think the Nigerian government, the military, uh, has definitely made progress. Um, and we're helping them to, to make even more progress. You know, some political analysts argue that many times when these things come up, they're symptoms of a bigger problem. Yeah. Uh, maybe like a failure of, I don't know, democracy or leadership. And we see you know, all that fractures you know, within mm. government or mm. the country itself. What are your thoughts on how Africa as a whole, especially member countries, have practiced democracy? And I've, had, and I've heard some really interesting ideologies and uh, theories about the fact that perhaps Africa needs its own type of democracy, that perhaps democracy in its purest form, whatever that is, has not worked for Africa. And perhaps we need to tweak it a little bit, uh, make it tailor-made for each individual country. I don't, I don't know how that works, but I'm just, but what are your thoughts? Uh, you probably have heard about some of yeah, these Yeah, I'd, I'd be careful about saying Africa isn't ready for democracy or, uh, you know, we need to adjust democracy to suit Africa. I mean, democracy is about people having a voice. Now, that can be done in lots of different ways, and there are different models. There's the American model, there's the British model, there's the French model, there's all sorts of different models. But ultimately, what it means is that regular people, normal people, the citizens of a country, can have a vote, and they can decide who is going to rule them. And if they're not happy with the governance uh, of the, that particular party, then they can throw them out of the election, and they can bring somebody else in. That is the pure form of democracy, if you like. You know, demos means the people. So it's about the people. Um, so anything which goes away from those basic principles, that basic principle of people's representation, is, I think, possibly a dangerous path. Now, I know there are different models uh, for Africa. Uh, there's a big question around constitutional limits, which, of course, was, a, was an issue here. Uh, term limits was an issue here under former President Obasanjo. Um, all of those things are, uh, are important, but ultimately what matters most, and what matters here in Nigeria in February, is that there is an election process which is free and fair, credible and peaceful, that enables people to have their say, that okay. they can express their opinion. Now let's move on, let's talk Brexit now. There have been calls for on the UK to strengthen ties, economic ties with and, with and play a greater role in the Commonwealth now you know, with the whole Brexit thing going on when you come out on the other side of the talks. Uh, and I, I imagine that perhaps the UK is going to use this opportunity, this meeting, to also expand trade relations or ties with member countries? Certainly. I mean, we, we, we have our uh, trade uh, agreements that we're um, pushing through, uh, starting negotiations. We can't obviously sign anything or, or move to those until we have formally left the European Union. Um, but talks are going on in a number of places. We're looking at um, what, what we can do with uh, Nigeria. Um, the Trade Minister was in London uh, just this week and I had a meeting with him. He met the Lord Mayor of London to talk about financial services, financial sector, so how can we improve all of that? Um, so yes, the, the, the UK is obviously interested post-Brexit in strengthening bilateral trade links within the Commonwealth, um, of which Nigeria is a very important member. So very much on the agenda. Um, but we have already got strong trade links. This is not something mm. new. It's about how, how we how can strengthen that. How significant is the Nigerian market or Nigeria as a trading partner to the UK? And does it change now or is it, is it, does it become even more significant now? I, with I, think it's, I think with Brexit it becomes more significant. I think it becomes more significant because we can now, uh, after we've left the European Union, we can negotiate our own trade deals, bilateral trade deals or trade deals within uh, groups 
we want to do that clearly. Do you think Nigeria. it might be difficult for you now because the EU is also going to do that with African countries, Nigeria also, and I don't know, it might become it might become some sort of a competition. What are your thoughts on that? Well, right now, as I said, we're still a member of the European Union, so we're not okay. going to we're not going to deal with any uh, we're not <laughs> going to deal with any okay. any trade uh, negotiations or sign up to any deals until we have left. Okay. Um, but yeah, I, I, I'm not denying we will be in competition with the European Union, but um, uh, we're in competition with, the, with members of the European Union as it is. You know, there are French companies and British companies that are pe competing for okay. contracts in, in Nigeria. Um, we're going to be able to, to do that, but we'll be able to do that on the basis of uh, lower tariffs and yeah. a more competitive market. Uh, and Britain's economy is very strong. Um, it's, it's growing, it's thriving, uh, and, and there's a lot that um, the UK has to offer. Paul, thank you so much for talking it's to us today. It's been an absolute, absolute pleasure having you on the show today. I've been speaking to Paul Arkwright, British High Commissioner to Nigeria.